This is Ajit. He's DW's climate reporter. Hi, Ajit. Hi. And this is you in the 1990s. I was a pretty cute baby. That's when the world really started talking about climate change and when you were just a child. And this is what you will look like in 2050. Hopefully by then, we will have solved global warming. I mean, if I look like that when I'm 57, I think I can handle it. Well, if you like it that much, let's send you to 2050 right now. Let's start with a really bold assumption that we have reached carbon neutrality in 2050. That's what many countries are aiming for after all. What's that like? The 2050s are completely different to the 2020s. Let's say that we're on track for meeting our climate goals and we're limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's in line with the targets that world leaders signed up to under the Paris Agreement. But that means the planet's one and a half degrees hotter than it was before the Industrial Revolution. And we have to live with the consequences. And there are some things we won't be able to predict. Can we actually remove these wrinkles? Okay, okay, but you are staying in 2050. Okay, so let's say this is 2050. We've limited global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We actually did it. But we suffered some losses along the way. This, for example. What you're seeing here, coral reefs. They basically belong in the history books. The vast majority are all gone. Even 1.5 degrees was too much for them. And this, Arctic sea ice? Well, only in the winter. This victory is actually pretty hollow. On top of that, some populated regions are almost impossible to live in now. Experts have been studying these scenarios for decades and they've always had lots of predictions. Projections indicate that uh, places around the Gulf region where high humidity and the extreme temperatures combine um, are becoming difficult. Uh, Southeast Asia is becoming difficult, um, which includes some of Chinese territory. India has difficult areas. The Amazon uh, will have problems for humans uh, to, to live in. Okay, wait, Ajit, you kind of need to ease me into bad news like that. This doesn't sound like a great victory at all. Actually, it sounds quite awful. Well, there is some good news. I mean, the air that I'm breathing now is way cleaner than the air that I grew up breathing. It, it feels great. Going toward net zero emissions would also mean that the air pollution will be eliminated by and large, because most of it comes from the, either from indoor uh, burning of unsustainable fuel wood or because of the regional use of the fossil fuels. Um, especially in the urban areas. Now, that is estimated to cost to eight to nine million premature deaths, mostly in the developing parts of the world. So that would be a huge health co benefit. And another good thing, life in 2050 has become way easier for vegetarians like me. Hang on, this sounds like a hard sell. My parents eat lots of meat and they're not about to stop. The thing is, there isn't enough land on earth for people to have really had that much of a choice people had to find ways to eat and farm more sustainably. We will probably also have changed our diets, but we will have changed it in directions where we are eating healthier and we have a much wider variety of choices. The essence of this is that we are likely to eat less meat or at least less red meat, uh, but in general, we will eat more plant-based uh, food and uh, we will uh, eat more healthily and we will probably get used to already in our childhood to, to the taste of different mouth-watering alternative uh, meat alternatives. And there's something else I love about this emissions-free world. Lots and lots of trees. We planted them to help suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. But it's not as simple as just planting forests, right? Won't the changing climate affect wildlife? Even in, in our mid-latitudes we see heat stress in the forests due to the combination of drought and heat. And, and this is a sign that some of our native species may no longer do very well in the climate of the future. So this is a challenge for people to plan. Um, we have not only the climate crisis, but in parallel, we have the biodiversity crisis and the two of them are intertwined. Oh, sounds awful. But a lot of trees at least help us suck more CO2 out of the atmosphere than we are producing, right? Yes, but the problem is we've already heated the planet by 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
and that means heat waves and wildfires have become more common and stronger. And every tree that's burned down is CO2 that we're putting back into the atmosphere. Now, heat waves have always been deadlier for poorer people and for older people. But that trend has just gotten worse. And I guess air conditioning is not an option? Well, a lot of people still need to use it, but it also takes up a huge amount of electricity. And so, depending on what your job is, it might be easier if you could actually just stay indoors. Most houses, old or new, have had to find ways to protect themselves from the heat. They've had to become energy positive, which means that they're producing more energy than they consume. Energy positive buildings are much more comfortable, both thermally and also air quality wise. We will always feel that there is this nice fresh air uh, inside. We won't feel cold or warm. Um, in general, also uh, the, the illumination, the lighting situation will be much more comfortable, uh, basically based on, on what uh, we want. Okay, but if you have to leave your house during a heat wave, can't you just cool off by jumping into a local pool? It's not that simple. Here in Northern Europe, we have water shortages in the summer. It's a problem everywhere. Even though we've limited warming to 1.5 degrees, it still wrecked the natural water storage system. Glaciers used to hold fresh water as ice in the winter, releasing it in the summer. But they're mostly gone. The previously stored water is now raising the sea level, making many places unlivable. And floods, as a result, are also becoming stronger. Places that relied on glaciers melting in the summer for their water supply are now facing shortages that have affected drinking water and agriculture. I think glaciers that are disappearing in essentially everywhere in the world um, do pose a, a big danger because they're source of much of the river runoff. Uh, so as they melt, the runoff will decrease. Think of the you know, Indian subcontinent, the freshwater uh, challenge will be even bigger than it is today in such a world if we don't act immediately and apply globally mitigation and adaptation measures. Okay, wow. The world out there sounds pretty grim in 2050. What about you, Ajit? Are you still a climate reporter? Do we even still need climate reporters once we go carbon neutral? Oh, I've still got plenty to do. There are so many extreme weather events that have been made stronger or more likely because of climate change. It can be pretty busy. We are um, projecting that there will be more impacts, even under 1.5 degrees uh, global warming. and. Staying at 1.5 is beneficial compared to 2. So every bit of warming matters uh, very, very clearly. So yes, in terms of living conditions, um, the environment um, may be more hostile, depending on the place where, where you are. And you cannot generalize this for all places, but on, on average, um, in the places especially where unfortunately human societies are already very vulnerable, these um, changes will be, will be largest. Yeah, that's something that hasn't changed. The poorest people are the hardest hit. Some regions have become almost impossible to survive in, while some islands have been literally swept under the sea because sea levels have risen so high. Poor, the poor, poorest of the poor, let's say, they wouldn't be able to, to, to afford to migrate. So they, we call, um, there's a term to call the subgroup of population as a trapped population, the immobile population. So they may wish to move, but they cannot. And that's, uh, that's also worrying because that uh, if people need to, to use migration as an adaptation strategy and they cannot, and the rich, of course, they would not probably, it's unlikely that they need to migrate because they can cope with the consequences much better. So it's a middle income that have certain resources to allow them to migrate, that tend to be more likely to move due to uh, changing climatic conditions. To cover these topics, you would need to fly all around the world. Well, to be honest, that's one thing that's been very slow to change. Carbon-free flights are really only starting to get off the ground now in 2050. We know how to travel without greenhouse gas emissions, with uh, trains. They are electric mostly. Uh, we know how to do that with uh, cars. If we, for example, go for electric cars or electric buses, um, there we have the technology already how to do this. We can also travel by ship short distances. There's also electric ships or, or uh, barges. Um, but where it's difficult today with technology is uh, large ships and long ship travel. 
and air travel. And we need to find innovative solutions how to still be able to uh, uh, go with a ship or with a plane from A to B. Um, and I'm hopeful that we are innovative because I think humans want to travel. Okay, so this is what a future will look like. If we keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But we're not on track to do that, Ryan. Like despite some countries claiming they want to be carbon neutral by 2050? Not at all. Politicians' pledges to actually meet these climate goals are not nearly enough. And their policies to actually achieve that are even worse. The good news, I guess, is that we can stop it if people take the right decisions. Well, I think some of the things that we experience today and that will intensify, both in severity and frequency, are the storms, the floods, the dry spells. Uh, this is a big danger for many, many people. Um, and this can be, at the same time, let me also say, that even these things that we cannot stop, they'll be significantly lower in one and a half world, one and a half degree world, than they would be in two or three degree worlds. And that's the direction in which we are heading. Uh, so these are really huge challenges. But if I may, uh, let me also observe that um, the stabilization at one and a half degrees is still possible. So I guess that's the good news. Well, that's enough 2050 for me then. That's enough for me too. Honestly, there are enough climate problems to worry about in the present before I even start thinking about the future. Hey, this is Dustin. I'm one of the reporters who worked on this video. We tried something new with this and we would love to have your feedback on it. So if you want to, please leave us a comment, a like, or even a dislike down below.